All right. Um, just before we hit that full on, just uh, like Nairi to just introduce uh, herself and the services, and then we'll move into Q and A time. So, I work for the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service, whereby we have three arms to the service. First of all, there's the temporary accommodation team, whereby if you've got to move out of your house for repairs or a rebuild on a temporary basis, <coughs> excuse me. Um, they link into landlords, either um, private landlords or our Césaire villages, which is in L Linwood Park, Rafiti, or Rangers, Rangers Park. Oh, dear, oh dear. <coughs> um, the next arm to the service is the um, financial side, whereby once your accommodation from your insurance has ceased, you may be able to apply for temporary accommodation through the government package. This all depends on your situation, if you've been in the house at the time of the earthquake, or if, um, and how many are in the house. But it's there. And there's also Earthquake Support Coordination Service, whereby um, there are coordinators, there's 30 of them, and they can be with you, walk with you, make a plan, um, go to meetings with you, just walk through the whole process and help support you, and you'll have this person for as long as you need to. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Nairi. So let's move into question and answer time. So uh, John's presented us with some acts and some, some legal phrasing, but what do we do with that? I mean, I listen to that and I think, oh my goodness, so what do I do now? So maybe that's in your head, so there's questions around that, and so we'll see, we'll see where we can get... Uh, in terms of uh, those types of thoughts. So uh, we'll just move, start at the back, and we'll come through to the front. So, Sarah. There we are. Yes. Okay. Um, and actually, just before we get started, I did have one question that had come in via social media that um, was requested to ask. So um, this is a question for John. Is there anything in the Building Act uh, that addresses substandard work. Thanks, Sarah. How the Building Act responds to substandard work is that MB, who is a building regulator, they have the ability to prosecute builders, and that will be one of the effects of their review, but they have no power to order any builder to carry out any remedial work. Instead, the councils have that power. So the councils can issue a notice to fix, which requires any builder or property owner to remedy any work which does not comply with the building code. If the builder or the insurer fails to do that, then they can be convicted of a fine up to $200,000 or $20,000 per day. But to the best of my knowledge, no council in Canterbury has issued a single notice to fix for non-compliant work, and I don't understand why that is the case. Right, thank you. Do you have a question? I'm not used to public speaking, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, how long do you have? Closer to mouth. I've got your cough too, by the way. Oh, <laughs> so, um, how long do you have... Um, when you go back into your house, how many days or months, months, do you have before it's sort of null and void with repairs? Um, generally, it depends if, it, if it's readily observable. If it's readily observable, then there's a limitation at which says you have six years. Six years. Um, but if the damage is latent and you can't see it until later, the maximum period is 10 years. Okay. But I've got water coming in and I've been trying to get it fixed for ages. So, you know, they said 90 days to me. But I'm, I, I think I'm underway now. Someone's helping me out. But it's been such a struggle. And, you know, they just said, no, it was out of the 90-day period. And I've got water. It's just sucking up through a wall and my carpet and under my stairs. And I just, you know, I just wonder where I stood. Well, you've been partially misled because the 90-day period would have been a defect liability period. Okay. But in terms of the legal obligation to address the issues, that would have been six years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask my question? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, there's a household who couldn't be here and they've asked us to ask another question. Uh, will the remedial repairs cost me any more? Um, well, I can't talk about what will happen in terms of private insurers, but um, Ian Simpson has said publicly that no homeowner will have to meet the cost of remedial repairs. So I imagine that will extend to the cost of the building work, the cost of investigating whether or not there are remedial issues, including the cost for independent experts and temporary accommodation costs, because that's all part and parcel of remedial repairs. Um, just adding to that um, last question, um, if we do get some uh, success with EQC and they come back and do some of this work that we think hasn't been done, some of it is in, um, hidden, it's in our walls um, under our foundations. One of the things they did during the, if the original repair was take off our cladding and replace it. What, uh, what happens if to remediate the work inside the walls, they have to take the cladding back off and put it back on again. Are they, do they, are they obliged to have to do that and pay for it? If that is necessary to comply with the building code, yes, they do. Hi. Um, so for me, in regards to the actual work that's carried out, it was possibly one of the most disempowering processes I've been involved in. Um, so now I'm on the waiting list for the remedial work to be done. So we were placed on that list around about April, May time. So we're just waiting now for them to come through. So the work, the remedial work that needs to be carried out is at the moment still sitting in a sense of what I perceive as a non-builder to be substandard work. So when I know that they're coming out, I've already been informed by EQC that I'll have to get a building report or somebody to come out and have that ready for when they turn up to go through it. So it sounds to me like I'm sort of being set up for a bit of an argument in essence. So I just want to know, is it that if they come out, that's the beginning of the dialogue and then there's an opportunity for that to carry on if we disagree or we need to do something more? Um, your question raises about six questions, all, all in one. Um, so I'll start by going off on a bit of a tangent. And that is that in 2013, the Human Rights Commission released a report called Monitoring Human Rights in the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery. And they identified a number of values which government organisations had to comply with in order to meet our government's human rights obligations. And one of them was a duty to empower affected people in the context of disaster recovery. So that's one of the things that government agencies, which includes EQC, need to do. So the process should be empowering for you. And so I think implicit in that is that it's not fair to expect you to pay for a builder's report to assess whether or not and the extent of substandard repair work. That's something that EQC should take responsibility for. Um, and in terms of the other thing you raised, when does the engagement start? It starts now. And in terms of when you have responses to your questions, you're entitled to be provided with time frames. Yeah, thanks. Um, like all homeowners, um, we move out of our homes and we were under cap. Fletch is handling the, uh, the uh, building and they appointed a builder. We shift out of home. You expect both Fletcher's and the builder to do competent work. So you're out of the home for 12 odd weeks and you come back and your house is all cladded up, all nice and new painted, all so look so fresh and there's so many people that have gone back into their homes thinking they're all rosy. But during the process of the repairs, I went back to my property and a builder uh, asked who I were. I told him I was the homeowner. He said, what's going on here is not right on the site. So um, I waited for his 
boss to come back and he said, what we're doing here isn't right. This is one of his workers for a start. And then the, his foreman came around and said, no, it's not right. I had a half inch crack in my foundation which went up the wall. And by the time it got up the top of the wall, it was a, started about 22 millimetre, but it kept opening up over time. And it was 25 mils crack down the window frame. So they took back the Summerhill stone about a metre and a half back each side and they just remortared the, the uh, Summerhill stone out to the window frame to square it up and they repaired the foundation with um, epoxy resin. Now my question is that I've been pushed around so many times to ring people up and ask, I'm on TC3 land, is epoxy resin the, the, the fix for the foundation? Because I stopped work on the site and as soon as they stopped work, the foreman turned up with the building company and he asked what was wrong. And I said, from the scope of report, uh, works report till now, that crack has opened up so much. So it's not what you were dealing with on the paper. So what we should do, is, uh, should do here is get an engineer. And he agreed, we're getting an engineer. So he said an engineer might not appear, as you say, an expert might not turn up for days. And it was, he said it could be weeks. But I've called on to the building site the next night and all the block work was done to the top of the eaves and they'd epoxy resin the foundation. So I called him up and I said, so now, what's the building, uh, sorry, what's the uh, engineer going to inspect? Because it's all covered up. He's got nothing to inspect anymore. And so they finished off the building and the um, roof line is two inches out of level. The water lays in the guttering, which was brand new, prior just to the earthquake, brand new guttering has got about an inch and a half of water laying in the dead end of it all the time. So my question is, what is the building code for, for foundations on TC3 land because they never got any building consent because I've checked with the, with the council. So what is the building consent for TC3 land? <coughs> well, um, the first thing I need to say is that I'm not qualified to answer that question because I'm not an engineer, but what the MB guidelines say, which is the minimum standard, is that for TC3 land there needs to be geotechnical assessment of the site, so shallow and probably deep geotechnical drilling, and also there needs to be engineering judgement before the repair solution is agreed. So in that situation, an engineer should have inspected when it was available to have inspected and determined the appropriate repair strategy. But also what you've done has highlighted an anomaly because a number of the agencies are saying that if work is exempt, they don't need to comply with the building code, they only need to comply with the standard pre-earthquake. That is in fact incorrect. The stand all building work must comply with the building code whether it's consented or exempt. Because um, my neighbouring property was uninsured, and the one on the other side of that, they um, dug massive great pits all around the foundation to, to stabilise the house. And you can't tell me that the difference between three properties changes so much that they just use a bit of epoxy resin and a half inch crack and leave a roof or the house not level, you know. The building code can't alter that quick over two sections, you know. Uh, I've been hoodwinked so many times by these people, and, and now the, the later repairs was the driveway and my front fence, and the front fence is cracked in several places um, after being replaced. They used a narrower block, which is structurally not as strong because you put concrete in a block at strength. They never replaced the foundation, and the insurance company's arguing with me about uh, not going any further. You know, I mean, older people, I think they've taken advantage of older people in the community um, and ju are just trying to hoodwing people. Uh, I've had, you know, it's just about driven me insane. Uh, and you get nowhere, and you keep getting these people who will not give you an answer. So with this one here, so John, uh, he... I mean, they've covered it up, and so in a sense that you've got a very strong opinion that there, the repair hasn't been right. What does a gentleman like this or a family or you know, a couple or whomever do where they have a strong sense that it's not right? What actions should they take? Uh, 
where they're not feeling sort of defenceless and not really knowing what to do because they're just fighting their insurer or their or EQC. Um, in this situation, I'm not saying what will happen, but what should happen is that there should be an audit, there should be an engineer involved in the audit, and there should be invasive testing so that the engineer can see what's happening underneath the cladding. That should have been done when the when everything was stripped off, but as he agreed, he agreed that there should have been an engineer and they hoodwinked me and I stopped past the site that next night and it was all done, you know, so they were... I agree with you, I agree with you. It's shocking, the people I've employed, they need to be lynched up on a rope. All right, so can we talk with you after this? Because I think you're certainly getting some services around to help you put that case properly if you're still in that situation where you're not getting any momentum. Uh, I think we need some help with that. And I think uh, people out there need to know that if you have a strong sense, as John said, that, that the agencies must respond with some a reasonable, fair response which makes sense to you. And that is how the law, as I understand it, as John's presented it, should work. All right, so let's, let's look at that afterwards, okay? Thank you. Um, hi, so we left our house for six to eight weeks in 2013. We returned to our house nine months later. Um, three weeks after returning home, we raised some concerns with our construction company who put a complaint on our behalf into, sorry, terms and things have changed so many times and I can't keep up with that, but I think it was to Fletcher's. May have been to AQC, so we en they entered us into the complaints process because they weren't prepared to rectify the issue. Um, this was in June 2014. By December 2014, AQC had told, after a couple of meetings at our house, had told the construction company to rectify um, the external works that were deemed to be not up to an appropriate standard. Um, we took a cash settlement on the internal works. <coughs> in April, so at that point they told us that work would start before Christmas. In April we had another meeting at our home where the construction firm were again told to undertake some certain tasks, the same tasks that they'd been told to do in December. Um, they didn't do it. In the between the two meetings, I believe the remediation process had changed. Um, so we had a new bunch of people the second time. When we were following up on that the following month, um, all people that had been involved working for EQC were no longer working for EQC. Um, and we were told that it would be referred to somebody else. Um, we called back two months later and there was no record of our previous call. Um, we had been, t sorry, the, at one point we were also told there was about to be a 10 day to rectify notice or a, they were about to serve paperwork on the construction company to begin the tasks they were supposed to do. Um, it was when we called up to follow up on whether that had been done, all of the people involved were no longer with AQC. Um, I've recently called EQC um, after kind of waiting for two months uh, with no, feedback on where we were up to because um, we were told we were going into then another remediation process. Um, sorry, this is very long-winded. Um, and the, there was no record of the previous conversation saying we would be entered into the new remediation process. I made a complaint um, as I was told that we may talk to someone again before Christmas um, and through the complaints process was basically told, well, at least they've given it a go and you just need to wait now because there's people who haven't had their homes looked at. Which I absolutely, um, on one hand, appreciate the fact that people who haven't had their house done, I mean, you're talking about natural justice and things, and there is nothing about this process that meets, in my opinion, I don't quite see how five years hits natural justice, but anyway, off my soapbox. My question, I've had two agreements on settlement, essentially. Um... The rem so the remediation tasks have been agreed. I can't get the agreement to become action. Um, where do I go? 
That's a very good question. Um, for repairs under the Fletcher's program, EQC is ultimately responsible, so they're the best agency yep. to go to. So it's EQC that have told us to wait until December. They lost our thing about the remediation process and they have twice, it was EQC that was managing the directing of the company to do the repairs. Fletcher's that have basically disappeared. Um, if you're unhappy with EQC, it's possible to make a complaint yeah. to the Office of the Ombudsman, but those complaints are also slow. I'm in a process. I'm in a process. I haven't been declined. I can't go to the Ombudsman yet, is what I'm being told. I'm in a process. Um, sometimes in these situations, <laughs> I've found that my clients have just gone through um, unorthodox channels, so they've contacted an MP, for example, or a minister, and that's got things moving. So sometimes it's worth just trying working? those things. So the minister Well, it, it, has, it has worked in some situations and it doesn't work in mm. others. But that's all that I can suggest, unless you want to go to court. I can't afford to go to court. Mm. Yeah, that's, not, what, that's, what, that's what everyone says. Yeah. The, the reality, yeah. It's just crazy. Like you said, I, I mean, it's great to sit and hear the presentation. I found you really informative. But you're talking about natural justice and the time frames and the um, uh, empowering process and uh, the rest of it. And I mean, I'm a. I, um, you talk about an empowering process, and I consider myself to be quite savvy with systems and quite a reasonable human being. Um, normally, I've got to a point where I. I I'm so stuck and lost, I don't know how to be reasonable, and I'm so successfully in a corner with nowhere to go, because actually what would court action achieve? I mean, beyond the fact that, I mean, it's not going to be any quicker than seeing anyone by December. Um, it'll just be more expensive. The, I, I don't understand how we're in a society with our constitution talking about natural justice, which includes time frames and Consumer Guarantees Act and all of these other pieces of legislation that people talk about, how do we turn that into some actual practical improvements? Uh, are you looking to becoming uh, an MP and uh, running for a parliament? <laughs> I mean, that is, was, is a big question which covers this process in terms of, I, th I personally, if, on a personal note with that, it's systems and processes have definitely not supported us very well at all. That's a polite way of putting it. Uh, and, yeah, the, certainly big questions are to be put to our own systems and processes for improving for the future or even for the present. However, uh, our plight when we're pretty tired, it's pretty hard to do that in this situation. It's a, it's a big one. Whether New Zealand will actually stand up and do something about it, I don't know, because we all seem to be caught up in the flag just at the minute. So if we're going to, we would have done it already. Yeah, but thank you for that. I think you've described a lot of frustration, which people certainly empathise and understand. Um, but I think you've done a lot of homework there and you're in this stuck and waits situation. So there's no... Uh... <laughs> yep. Sir, so, no. All right, ladies and, and gentlemen, look, it's, um, it's just coming up on five to seven, and thank you very much. One more question just at the back before we finish. Just before we get to that question, after this question, um, uh, we'll, you do have time to come back and talk one-on-one -on -one with John if you wish to, so please you know, don't feel that you have to rush, rush away. And do remember that all of this is being recorded along with PowerPoint so that you can come back to it later. Last question, ma'am. I'm sorry to do this, but I just think it's so depressing. We're all getting very depressed about the whole damn thing, and you know it just wears you out. You've got to prove yourself all the time, and that's where it's wrong. You know, we're good, honest people. Why do we have to prove ourselves all the time? That these people, I know it's government money and all the rest of it, but I've been a taxpayer all my life. I pay secondary tax as well. I work hard. I do my bit, and I just have to prove myself all the time. It's no, not fair. I think everybody in the room understands that, that frustration. Um, the our unfortunate or fortunate thing is that we are the last bastion for our own houses. Unfortunately, no one else is going to do that, so we have to hang in there. But the thing is, we don't have to do it by ourselves. 
Oh. We have services Sorry. here. We have ways Sorry. to support. Yeah. It's not necessarily the, the best way, and it's a shame that we have to do it. But I think joining together, coming to these seminars, using the residential advisory service or earthquake support coordination, the hub here, or there are other organisations to do that. We need to sort of just keep rallying and working with each other. Anyway, thank you for that, and thank you all for coming.